Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to being part of Making History, where we have jointly collaborated in creating Suncalp's first hybrid summit. Congratulations to everybody. A big round of applause to all of us. So, I would like to begin this session with a question. Did you know that by the year 2025, the Insure Resilience Global Partnership plans to insure more than 150 million people who are currently vulnerable and in uninsured or underinsured. Just how will they go about achieving this momentous milestone? To find out, join us this afternoon as we listen to three or four riveting speakers to help us unpack just how the insure resilience is going to achieve this milestone. And to help me run this show today, I have online on the airwaves, Mr. Isaac Magina. He is currently the head of agriculture, underwriting and marketing in West Africa for the Africa, Re Africa Reinsurance Corporation or Africa Reinsured. And the gentleman in red is Elias Omondi. He is representing FSD Africa, that is Financial Sector Deepening Africa. And he will be sharing what it means to design innovative risk modeling um, frameworks to enable us to get to this milestone of 150 million people. And last but not least, we have Dr. Bashir, Dr. Hassan Bashir, and he'll be sharing the view from the front lines. What does it take to build a sustainable, inclusive insurance ecosystem in Africa? What does it take to support the missing middle? Ladies and gentlemen, to kick things off, allow me to share a brief overview of what IFC does, what it has been doing in inclusive insurance, and what is next on the horizon. My name is Anne Wangalachi. I'm an agribusiness and financial sector specialist at IFC. Welcome. Allow me to skip the gentlemen's brief bios. When they begin speaking, they will tell us themselves why they deserve a seat on the panel today to take us through what they will bring to the table to ensure we have more than 150 million people who are currently underinsured to be insured in the next three years. The Global Index Insurance Facility is a nearly 11-year-old program that was started with the intention of scaling catastrophic insurance to ensure that when disasters strike, countries are not left at the mercy of the elements. And how do we do this? We use indices, weather-based indices, to design insurance products that can be used to design the premiums and payouts that will now ensure that people are more resilient after a disaster strikes. So this work has been going on in Africa, in Latin America, and in the Caribbean. So we are proud to share that since 2010, when we started with a paltry 14,000 contracts, we have now insured 12 million people as of the last count. And how do we do this? We work with insurers, we work with reinsurers, and we work with everybody who works with the vulnerable, especially in agriculture and food systems. So as I have mentioned, we use weather-based um, indices to ensure that the claim payouts are done very swiftly. And everybody is moving to digital fast, and especially mobile fast. And we saw this really play out during the, uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic, whereby the claims officers from insurance agencies could not travel to the field to verify the claims. But because these were set upon pre-agreed indices, the premiums were paid out to farmers. And guess what? They were paid on mobile. So farmers were happy. Everybody was happy despite the COVID pandemic. So we will be scaling this work in the next initiative that I will share shortly. So allow me to begin with an overview of inclusive insurance. So what is inclusive insurance? Inclusive insurance is about reaching the base of the pyramid. It's about reaching the underserved. It's about reaching the underinsured. So think about it as financial inclusion, but for insurance. Previously, we had people who had no bank accounts, no credit history, 
In short, they didn't exist except for their national identity cards. But now with, in, with micro insurance and inclusive insurance, we're going to make sure that all those who deserve to be insured, whether it's for their crops, whether it is for their infrastructure, whether it's for transport, that they will um, get to be insured by all the actors in the ecosystem. So as you can see here, we, are, we take the SWAV framework. So S, so S is for simple. So currently people say we are not insured because it's too complicated. Who has time to read a 10-page insurance document? And the fine print is usually at the end. <laughs> and you never read that, but you rush to sign. So it has to be, the policies should be simple, the conditions should be simple, um, the marketing should be simple, and the procedures to sign on should be simple. Secondly, the insurance should be easy to understand. Whoever is insuring or being insured should understand what are they covered for and what are they covered for to make the payment of premiums easier. La thirdly, it should be accessible in terms of purchasing, in terms of uh, price, the premiums, the claims, everything should be accessible to this market that is on the right. We also um, are learning that people want insurance to provide value for money. So if I buy this premium and the event that I've been insured against doesn't occur, is it a waste of money? What if it occurs next year and I'm not insured? So we need them to see what is the opportunity cost of being insured versus not being insured. And last not, but not least, it needs to be efficient for everybody in the ecosystem. The insurer, the reinsurer, and the insured. So as you can see on the slide, the people who are the candidates, the archetypes of the um, inclusive insurance candidates, they are the low income earners. They have irregular income. They have low disposable income. Most of their income goes to essentials. And therefore, insurance would have to make a very strong case to ensure their buying. So whether at the micro level, at the meso level, that's in the medium, or at the macro level. Next, please. So at IFC, we realized that the, the protection gap, that is the gap between the payouts and the insurance premiums, is about 60%. And this was in 2018. So currently, it, it should be higher. It could be about 80%. So what is the world doing about this? So the global index insurance facility is financed by the Insure Resilience Partnership, which represents the, the great seven nations in the world, the G7. And they have set the ambitious target that I started with of insuring 150 million vulnerable people in three years. That is by 2025. How will they get there? So they want to work with entities like IFC or the World Bank Group to ensure that all the work that has happened in the past is building a strong foundation to get us to this 150 million insured people globally. So for IFC, we have a new program. It's called the Inclusive Insurance for Africa. And we have a target of reaching the countries cited there. And this is because these countries already have insurance programs at national level. They have regulators who are interested in making insurance work for the masses and for the underinsured. And they have insurance ecosystems that are functional. So we are exploring how do we bundle health, climate resilience insurance, agri-insurance, and business continuity. We are all still grappling with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that the missing middle, who are the MSMEs, were hardest hit. Some could not offer their services out of home. Some could not offer their services uh, while at home. Some had to shut down their businesses. So how do we ensure that resilience is more wholesome? It's not just resilience to natural disasters, but rather resilience to economic shocks as such as we are experiencing now with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we want to come up with scale responsive innovative and tech-enabled micro-insurance to deal with the pain points that we have seen of the underinsured. And we also want to leverage financial inclusion because as I have mentioned, everybody now is mobile first or digital first. So as I have indicated, we have four core pillars. The fifth one is about communication knowledge and knowledge sharing and partnerships. But we want to build inclusive insurance products. We want to test them. We want to scale them. 
we want to have strategic partnerships to ensure that we reach the last mile. Similar to what was done in financial inclusion, we want to reach the last mile with insurance. Then we want to promote digital insurance solutions. And last but not least, we want to reach women because more often than not, women are the invisible and missing middle. So we want to ensure that they are insured. So allow me to double click on the inclusive product development. So we will do this in partnership with the ecosystem. So we will make sure that we link climate linked business continuity insurance. We link it to health. We link it to agricultural insurance because those are the kinds of insurance that people care about. But how will we develop these products? That's where all the experts in the room come in. We are crowdsourcing, um, we are crowdsourcing the intelligence. We are crowdsourcing the insights so that we can be able to develop the ecosystem and the products that work. We will also develop health insurance products because we want to bundle health, business continuity insurance, and agri-insurance. And we will also build stakeholders' internal capacity to do this. Then we will have strategic partnerships, as I've mentioned, with reinsurers and insurers. And we will also work with uh, microfinance institutions, cooperatives, because they have the reach, they have the last mile reach with the underinsured or the uninsured. And last but not least, we will leverage IFC's past experience. So for instance, with the experience account, we were able to, to provide support that enabled the insurance companies to insure more people. So with that, I will now turn it over to Isaac Magina for his remarks. Oh, good afternoon, um, everyone, and thank you, Anne, for the introduction on the topic. Uh, so I am privileged, I feel privileged to be really part of this conversation this afternoon, uh, because um, the whole topic about inclusive insurance is a relevant one, especially in the age that we are living in, and uh, uh, because obviously uh, humanity is confronted with difficult um, options, but then as private sector players, I think it is our duty to provide for solutions. So as a brief introduction of, about who I am, um, uh, my name is Isaac Magina. I head the agri um, the agri and marketing and uh, agri and writing and marketing uh, division at uh, Africa Re. I'm currently based in Lagos and uh, greetings from this beautiful city of Lagos. Um, but uh, previously, I have been involved in a lot of work uh, regarding uh, index insurance, agricultural insurance, um, as well as the corporate, private uh, agricultural corporate world, uh, where I worked for institutions like Bayer. But then, much more importantly, um, two years, uh, I mean, seven years ago, I did join the Swiss Re in Zurich, where I was basically responsible for public sector engagement. And uh, this was uh, an opportunity for me because it gave me the understanding about um, the whole topic about bridging the protection gap. And when we talk about that essentially, or meaning um, we have people, a lot of people who are not really um, insured. And so whenever we have got uh, climate risk uh, uh, scenarios, like say, for example, droughts or earthquakes, I mean, um, our business is disrupted and they are not able to respond to that. And so uh, essentially um, then uh, it lends itself in the topic about uh, what we're discussing this afternoon. Um, but then after seven and a half years in Zurich, I did opt to come to Lagos, and, uh, which is really an exciting journey for me and um, being closer to, to, the, to, to, to the market and also having uh, working with a Pan-African company which really understands the African story very well. So that really gives me an opportunity to really, um, I mean, a valid license to discuss, uh, to, to, to effectively contribute in this topic. So thank you, everyone. And we look forward to a very engaged afternoon. Thank you. What are you seeing in inclusive insurance? How is it changing? Yes, thank you, thank you, Arne, again. I think, uh, as I put it earlier, the issue is uh, we discuss about um, 
bridging the protection gap. And uh, sometimes uh, and, and it is the responsibility of everyone to get involved because uh, traditionally coming from an insurance point of view, I mean, you have got uh, the normal insurance classes. I mean, I, I talk about property insurance. We have got um, motor insurance, for example, and even the building that you are in at the moment, it is insured. But then when you look at the global insurance figures, then it is more or less on the formal sector. And that is where you get insurance. Um, but then we have a huge chunk of people. And so um, when you look, for example, the population of Africa, where you're talking about slightly above a billion people, right? You, you're talking about the concentration of that commercial segment in the upper, say, six, um, um, say around um, 300 million people who really are they will be in the formal employment, they will be having business because, or they will be having a car, and because maybe car insurance is compulsory, that is the kind of group that is, uh, is, is insured. But then we have another bottom of the pyramid which really has no access to, to, to insurance at all. And these are the people who really suffer whenever um, a lot of, um, I mean, first of all, the characteristic of these people is that they tend to be socially disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged, and so they cannot be able to purchase properly priced I mean, um, uh, insurance product or financial product. But there's also a challenge about education knowledge. So when then uh, you confronted about, uh, of course, when, when disasters happen, like for example, the, 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 the recent cases we have seen in places like Mozambique, where you have uh, Cyclone Idai coming in, you know, uh, business are disrupted. And then you have got uh, crops being swept away or, uh, or people dying, but then these are not insured. And we're saying that this is a very significant market. If you're going to, to, to leave them out of the insurance value chain, then obviously we are missing a lot. But then it has also been demonstrated elsewhere that really insurance can play a very critical role, not only in improving the economic situation of people, but also um, improving the overall life condition of people. And so we're saying insurance is a relevant topic. Uh, a very, it plays a very le a relevant topic in improving the quality of life of people. And one way is really cushioning them from the risks that are involved in, in, in their day-to-day -day life. And so because the conventional insurance value chain is concentrating in a more formal sector, we have a big chunk of people out there which needs to be reached. And so then this brings in what is the missing middle in this case, how can we reach those people? And so this then makes this topic very, very, very important. Oh, thank you very much. So in summary, you're saying there is a fortune at the base of the pyramid, and we just need to explore it and exploit it. And also we need to use um, inclusive insurance really to cushion the most vulnerable. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. So I'll, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Elias Omondi to give us his remarks. Uh, he also has a presentation. Over to you, Elias. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I like uh, the way Anne referred to me as the gentleman in red. And really, um, this was purposeful and it was intended. Because if you look into this room and maybe, I don't know who are watching us, I don't know how many people are in red. I'm the only one in red. And the reason why I've done that is because we are exposed. And I want to talk about two very critical components. One is the exposure that we have in this particular continent. And secondly, the red comes from the reason why I'll be talking about maths, a bit of maths. And I know most of us don't love maths. We only love to count money, right? So let us, let us take this up. So um, I liked the way uh, we've kind of come up with a very interesting topic. And we want to talk about um, inclusive insurance in Africa. And ideally, we are talking about protection of the missing middle. Uh, is that middle really there? It is existing. But are people really looking forward into bringing these particular people into the space of this discussion that we're having today? Now, I work for FSD Africa. Uh, FSD Africa is a development agency that looks into reducing poverty in Africa. And we work mostly uh, with financial markets. I'm a senior manager in charge of risk regulations. Now, let us take this up. Uh, Africa is highly in 
a very precarious condition in terms of climate. And if you look at the, this particular continent, everything is driven by climate. Diseases are highly also come through climate. And that's why when you go to the village, people will tell you because of maybe there was rain, some people have been infected by malaria or something like that. So there's so many linkages that really relate to climate. Now, one of the key things is that Africa also contributes the least emissions to the world, but it becomes the most vulnerable continent. It is estimated by, by but 30 out of 40 African countries are highly exposed to climate risks. The second thing is that clim uh, Africa is estimated to lose around 30% of their GDP through climate. That is by 2030. Um, and we are talking about ensuring around 160 uh, thousand, uh, thousand people across Africa by uh, 2025 and something like that. And we are looking at, again, the way there's a big exposure when it comes to climate risk. Now, climate on the other end is what drives us. Uh, in Africa, when there is no rain, there is no food. And whenever the rains miss, most people are, are, more, are highly exposed. Students don't go to school. Uh, the women that would basically have something to sell in the market, they don't really get to the market. Um, th what also we need to kind of look at that is that 23% of Africa is highly dependent on nature, right? So there's also an, an element of nature risk. There's global warming that is highly rising, and we need to start thinking about how then do we resolve all these, particulars, uh, these particular problems. It has been mentioned by Isaac that there are issues to do with economic, social, and even just, uh, I would say, traditional cultural practices in Africa do really affect uh, this particular region in terms of how we address risks. Can you go to the next slide? And then that really brings us to what are the key challenges around these risk markets? Now, there, there are various challenges, but I would, I would only group them into three components. One arises from the demand side. In Africa, we have a very weak demand for insurance or any risk protection component. So for instance, issues around affordability and untalked about, do we really need to provide subsidies? Will that be long term in terms of addressing the challenge that we have? There's a lot of distrust within the risk protection uh, tools or instruments that we use. Uh, there's also around information. Do we really provide the right information? Issues to do with inconsistent public budgeting do governments really have this particular component really taken care of? Or most of the time, whenever there is a drought, uh, what happens in most African countries, you have to contribute. And there are these drives for food, right? Whereby you are, you are told you need to bring dry food stuff. And that will be put together to address a particular challenge. So that basically indicates there's a lot of, I would say, inconsistent budgeting around these particular components. Now, if you look at the other side, in terms of the, the, the supply side, also in terms of the African context, there's a low quality of supply. We, do we have relevant products? Or is it, does it, we, we, do we really look at insurance as something that is meant to address particular issues or particular challenges? So we kind of see low margins coming through, and that really gives no ability for investors. Because if today I talk to all of us are in this particular room. Who wants to be the next big insurer in Africa? And in, even if you go to that particular space, are you going to look at the lowest of the pyramid? Definitely no. You will be looking at those people who are driving cars. You provide the most basic conventional products that really relate to what uh, these particular people will really be wanting you to provide. So we kind of have an in, uh, also a very ineffective market reach, right? Whereby we want to reach out but we cannot treat them because of so many issues that arise out of the reach. They, we, we don't have in the infrastructure, we don't have the tools, and even looking at issues of data, do we have enough data to really provide the right, the right instruments to these particular people? Now, in terms of financing, and it's good that um, we need to think about uh, really funding uh, the, global, uh, uh, the, the global climate uh, risk. Now, if you look at the amount of money that was put into Africa, only around 546 billion was invested in Africa to combat climate change. But in terms of what was needed, 
we needed between 1.6 to 3.8 million do trillion dollars to achieve this particular transition. So we are not really getting enough money. So that means that we quickly need to think about mitigation adaptation to really address some of these particular risks because we've gone through one very, I would say, uh, a, a big risk in terms of COVID. We, we kind of tested our resilience in Africa, but climate change is something that we really need to quickly go in and ensure that we provide the right for adaptation. So this basically meets around 7%. In, in our region, in this particular continent. And if you go further, even the African government themselves, they're not looking into funding some of these particular issues that we are talking about, particularly on climate change. So there is need to kind of look at the entire sector. How then do we bring in the financial sector? How do we bring the financial players to really deal with these key risks that will be arising out of this change? In terms of the physical risks, we have extreme weather events, so for instance, uh, we've been having club flooding in different countries. Uh, you can recall that different cities are also under threat of flooding. Uh, we kind of seen the gradual change in climate changes, the issues around the transition risk, because if you are telling us to now come up with the climate policies, we will be able to kind of now face the transition risk because we have to transition to low carbon and, and all those particular components. It might mean that we might not really need to be driving more. We need to drive less because we want to have low carbon emissions. Uh, there's also around thinking around liability risks, right? So for instance, if these particular people that are exposed and in terms of compensating them, how then do we deal with these two risks that we are talking about, the physical and, and the transition risks? So that really then pushes us to the middle. So we are kind of faced and what basically we foresee in this particular world is that we need to kind of apply leverage at the middle of the, of the game because we want to ensure that the penetration, particularly in Africa, in terms of insurance, is below 3%. Now, global average requires to have around 7%. Most of the African countries are not even near the 3%, right? So, for instance, I'll give you an example. Here in Kenya, the penetration is around 2.3%. In Nigeria, it's below 1%. In Uganda, it's below a percentage. That means that those people are highly vulnerable and highly exposed. So how then do we basically move and increase insurance penetration in these particular regions? The second point is the coverage. You, can, you kind of see the insurance covers only 2% of disaster induced related risks. So that really means that in circumstances where an African country is faced by any calamity, then it's between you and God. And most of the time, we say God will help us all. But also we need to kind of look at ways in which we can mitigate some of these particular risks. Another thing is the challenges that we still address every day, the demand and supply. So when we look at that, that is a missing component within the middle. And there are various ways that we need to look at it. And, and that means that we, all of us, we need to think about how then do we support risk mitigation and adaptation. We need to think about how we kind of now pull risk together, which is vital for things such as health financing, because without really pulling some of these particular risks, we will not be able to solve these particular challenges. We've been talking about insurtechs, basically insurance and technology. How then do we ensure that they improve customer journeys? How do we ensure that they provide access to data that is needed? At the same time, we kind of enable to have scalable solutions. At the end of the day, we need to develop an environment that is enabling for market growth and innovation. So there is what we need to think about, credit financing. We need to think about insurance for these particular people. We need to think about quality inputs and mechanization. Because even if you're insuring this particular farmer and he's still using the traditional methods whereby he uses uh, the sticks to dig, Ideally, even if you give him the next best product in the world, you will not be able to resolve some of these particular challenges. There is need to access to savings, but also how then do you ensure that there is quality market? The challenge is, is that they'll be able to produce, but remain with those particular, with the production at home, and some of the time it will go by. How then do you ensure that they are able to move to the next, uh, next stage? So ideally, if you go to the next slide, we kind of look at what would be the current environment, 
what will be the possible and what should be the aspirational. So currently, we all know that we are faced with risks, right? And that this particular risk that we face means that we don't have enough food. That means that Africa will always have what we call food insecurity. The second component, which is possible, and we need to work towards that particular possibility, is that we can improve the livelihoods. And I like what IFC is doing. They're already coming up with solutions that will be able to improve livelihoods in terms of addressing these particular risks. And this means that we need to increase access to finance and also agricultural services, quite key. Now, what is aspiration? And this is something that might take us to the last mile when we think about the exposures that the people at the lowest the pyramid get. And one of the key things is that we need to build a farmer-centric business model. Are we able to transform our farmers into small agribusiness units that will be able to create value for their journey throughout their lifetime? Because it's not only about producing food. We want to ensure that they'll add value to the produce that they're providing, and they can easily work within uh, ecosystems to enable them to come up with the rightful solutions. Next. So they are guiding principles, and, and, and I wouldn't really want to dwell much in this. And the guiding principle is that we must be able to provide the right accessibility. We must be able to provide uh, proportionality, because some of the challenges that we are facing in Africa needs to have a very proportional approach to address them. We need to think about inclusion, right? How do we build a model that will be highly inclusive? Innovation should be at the center. At the end of the day, cooperation needs to be, uh, ne needs to be enabled. Thank you very much, and I'll be able to address some of the questions that will be coming my way. Thank you. So I'll now ask our experts, our panelists, what do they see as changes in the micro-insurance landscape from where they sit, um, put on your risk modeling, mathematical lenses, and share with us where do you see the changes in the, in the industry, in micro insurance, either from a demand side or from the supply side, and then we'll hear from Bashir, and lastly we'll hear from Isaac on the airwaves. Right, um, I, I would say uh, in terms of the micro insurance, um, the, the risk, gets highly evolving. And ideally, when, when you are given a task to model an evolving risk, the key component that you need to have in mind is that what is the bottom line of this particular risk? Because uh, at the first instance, this particular person that wants to be covered using this micro uh, product might have a particular need. But this need changes based on the experience that you will be having across uh, the, the, across the year. So what really the, the, the modeling and the risk experts need to think about is what is the base for this particular, uh, particular, particular maybe farmer or, or, or small businessman, and how then do we ensure that we provide the flexibilities whenever his need are increases or reduces, then he's able to really have that flexibility in, in modeling, uh, in basically affording, affording that particular product. But the challenge is, if you look at the conventional insurance products, uh, the risk is determined first hand, and the, the price is pa pegged on the first level. Now, that means that you will have to pay, and, and that is it. But for microinsurance, uh, maybe uh, 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 person, if this risk reduces, he wants to get some money back. So how then do you ensure that you are able to give him something back? Remember, then if the risk does not happen, he will ask you, I gave you some money last year and nothing happened. Where did you take my money? Okay. So can you be able to have a component whereby the, that particular element could trigger into the next component? And how then do you ensure that he really understands that if the risk did not happen, you, you, you are basically operating in a pooling kind of an effect. Some, somebody else might have benefited from you. Or maybe can they get a cash back as a group in terms of really enabling them to understand how they can manage the risk. So the, the, the biggest thing here is flexibility in terms of determining the right price out of the evolution of the risk. At the same time, 
basically enabling these particular persons to understand uh, what uh, the, the, the micro insurance or uh, micro components really entail. Uh, the third thing is, is regulation. And we, we've seen different African countries uh, thinking uh, on how uh, they would bring regulations at, at, at the center of, of these particular types of risks. And, and mostly these regulations guide uh, market conduct because these people need protection. The people that are at the lowest of the pyramid, you know, they, they might not be able to get the highest paid lawyer to get into the financial institution and, and kind of fight the battles. So ideally, market conduct becomes a very critical component in terms of how the product is sold to them, but at the same time, what do they really get from these particular products? So the customer centricity out of not only uh, what we call the financial value, there's also what we call the experiential value. What experience do they get? Mm -hmm. So that is something that we need to think about when it comes to microinsurance programs. Not only the payouts that they're going to get, but what value of experience will they get? Because if anything happens within the experiential value or the experience value, then it is easy for that thing to be spoken within the village. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is that they'll be throwing stones <laughs> on you. <laughs> So you raise an important point about value for money. They have to see what is being insured, what is it buying them, and then word of mouth marketing or dismarketing, if there's such a term as that. So um, that brings me to Bashir. Your quick thoughts, uh, what are you seeing from the front lines? Thank you. My quick thoughts uh, to what uh, Elias has just talked about, I'll add um, the need for uh, communities, individuals, peoples to understand um, the value of insurance. What they buy in it? What is in it for them? Um, uh, traditionally, uh, insurance has been pushed. Um, products developed at corporate head offices and then taken to markets and uh, with the assumption that people will buy. And quite a lot we come across uh, the completely different uh, perception that people who have policies do not even understand why they have it. So that appreciation, I mean, uh, you know, villagers, pastoralists, farmers, and traders, um, you know, the stock of uh, a good chunk of the African, one, one billion African people who uh, Elias talked about are generally either informal or, or, or rural in nature. And uh, one aspect we fail to see is that they need to actually understand, appreciate, and uh, own what they are buying. When they go to a shop and they buy food for their family, they know why they are paying for that. They understand why they have to sell an animal to acquire a piece of cloth or some stock of food, basket of food or, or medicine for their animals. Or they, they understand why. They buy water, they buy fodder. They understand why they are doing that. They need to understand on the same level, they need to understand insurance. And the idea of pushing it, simply a product they don't know has, has been detrimental to scaling. So I'll add that. Um, I'll also add uh, that uh, it's, it's high time industry designs micro products from the client's viewpoint uh, and not from what corporate headquarters wants. Um, it should be based on the economies of, of uh, the micro uh, buyers. It should be based on their understanding. It should be based on, 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 on the seasons when they have money and when they don't have money. Um, I have had experiences where I was selling, uh, selling micro products and I've been told, you're always here when the season is the harshest. Why, do, why are you not here during rainy season? When we, have, when we have ghee and when we have milk and when our animals are, have body weight and we can sell them, why are you always at the borehole at the time the season is the worst and, and our animals are not selling and we have no milk, and, you see? So that shows you that I have not understood uh, the circumstances of the market I am, I am working with. So it's important that we design products from that viewpoint. Um, it's important that, uh, uh, that they appreciate from uh, a point of knowing and buy it from a point of knowing. Anything else, you might have a sell once, you will not have a repeat sell or a repeat buy. And that's detrimental to insurance, uh, uh, um, Elias will tell you as, as a former regulator. So, so, so those are the, the, the few things I want to add. Thank you very much, Bashir. So really, you don't want to be seen as an agent of doom when you're selling this microinsurance. So really understanding the life cycle of farmers and 
those you are insuring. So um, we know we'll hear more from you, of course, from your past experience. But I'd like now to turn over to Isaac. Um, do you have any thoughts on this as well as a reinsurer? What are you seeing or what have you seen? When we talk about inclusive insurance, I mean, there are so many examples that really come to mind. But um, I think, uh, in, in especially when you're talking about agricultural and climate risk insurance, and uh, one, uh, um, one time we have had a conversation with farmers, and I like what um, Bashir uh, just uh, alluded to, that we have to, dev uh, to be more or less um, develop products with um, a, a, a demand kind of driven approach, not necessarily supply driven, because most cases we we having products being pushed to the market with, uh, but then without a proper understanding of what exactly uh, the people we, we are targeting want. Uh, but then um, several years ago, we have asked this question about if you give um, a, a farmer, for example, um, $10 uh, or 100 shillings, Kenya shillings, to spend on insurance, and you ask them, list down in terms of priority, which will be the main areas, uh, I mean, which insurance products would you buy? And uh, it was surprising that actually agriculture came in, agriculture insurance um, and climate risk uh, came in a distant fourth or fifth position thereabout. And uh, farmers mentioned our issues as about how we will secure um, our food. Um, I want to be sure if I fall sick, I'll go to hospital. I want to make sure that if uh, I die, my children go to school. Um, I mean, those those were the concerns of the farmers and, and uh, of the people we are trying to, to sell agriculture insurance programs to. But then it brought in the whole topic about if we're going to, um, to offer sustainable solutions uh, for the market you're looking at, then obviously we have to be broad-minded in, in the way we are approaching this question because also just coming in and saying, yes, um, agriculture insurance is what the smallholder or the bottom of the pyramid need maybe um, uh, it's, it's, it's not always conclu uh, conclusive. But then after even having said that, I think also um, what is important is uh, to make it to also understand the revenue streams of these people that you're talking about, because obviously source of income, uh, the, the topic we're talking about is more or less how do we protect their incomes and because they are less privileged. Then the question of um, providing insurance, agriculture, for example, becomes a key one, uh, in, in because that is you protecting their revenue streams. But then, out of that protecting their revenue streams, then you can be able to build other classes of. Uh, they can be able to buy other classes of insurance, and so um, uh, meaning that um, if if you you're going to have a sustainable uh, offering uh, insurance or embedding insurance in part of the uh, developing resilience for communities that you're dealing with, then obviously you have to be um, broad enough, uh, have a consultation with the people on the ground. I mean, I mean the, the, the target market that you're looking for. And this calls for a different approach. It's not just a traditional approach that we have had, for example, when you're selling a motor insurance policy or an engineering uh, policy or, or medical insurance policy. You have to really understand the circumstance under which these people you are you're trying to target find themselves in, and also there are issues about what, uh, how can I then distribute that, of course, from a purely marketing perspective, and then and, and then tweaking it to to fit in the insurance landscape, meaning that then new narratives emerge, like, for example, how do we embed technology into this? Where is the space for, um, where is the role of, of technology in this space? Um, how do you come up with new concepts to cover, uh, to offer protection to these people? And so it's a new and exciting area. And I think that is we are all um, uh, looking forward to increasing insurance protection uh, for the people we, we're targeting is a good thing overall, but then also it has financial uh, opportunities for various players along the way. So I see this as an area of growth because as we know that insurance penetration in Africa is very low. I mean, Kenya is ahead, that's like, I mean, but behind miles behind South Africa. And then you cannot talk about Nigeria and the other countries like Kenya, like Uganda. I mean, they're still lacking behind. And what that
enhances the, a lot of opportunities. And so what is going to drive this growth is this new thinking, because already the up there where everybody's playing, it is more or less saturated. And um, I remember my my former CEO used to use this uh, phrase very much: um, "Blue ocean and red ocean." Where people are, I mean, in the in the blue ocean is enchanted territory. You can do a lot of things, but in the red ocean is where the sharks are eating every other. Uh, I mean, eating each other up there. And it, the current insurance space in 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 Africa is like that because everybody is competing in this small space. But then. Uh, we have a lot of space to to really innovate and come up with practical solution that will also improve the quality of life on the continent uh, through programs that will focus on inclusive insurance and i think it is we are in exciting times and i think uh, um, all of us can rally together to make this work so i think in in a brief summary i think that is my contribution towards that thank you all right, thank you so much, Isaac. So what I'm hearing from you is that we have a lot of headroom to develop in inclusive insurance. So to change gears, I'm going to invite Bashir to take three minutes. <laughs> Dr. Bashir, over to you. Thank you. I think in three minutes, I can do a very good greeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so insurance, um, so that we all agree what it is, is a promise um, over time, over, over defined time for an amount of premium paid. Yeah, um, when you insure your car, you actually, what you get is you pay money now, you give me money and I give you a promise that if something happens within the next 365 days, um, I will do X. So that's actually what insurance is. That promise, um, as insurers, we count the days, the 365, 364, 363, 362. And as we get closer to zero, we are happier, you know? And hopefully we'll go, we'll take, we'll reach day zero when you have not claimed. Then we take that money to profit and we uh, tell our shareholders we have done well. So this is what insurance is. Um, Elias wants us to return some of that money back <laughs> to the customers. Um, but uh, I think some of some models did appear in Kenya. Um, Elias and Magina, when they were introduced and did not say, Elias is my former regulator. And Magina was my reinsurer for a decade uh, around index insurance, climate insurance. So I know both men very well. Um, the missing middle. For me, the definition of missing middle, slightly different from Anne, is those with the those who will have had the ability to reach the customers that the insurers who are based in the formal sector are not willing to go to. Most insurance in Nairobi and the big capitals of our counties are not willing to go to the ground to look for customers who are mobile, who are disaggregated, who are um, whose premiums is micro. They want to spend their energy in the capitals. Uh, in the sec formal sectors, they want to ensure buildings and universities and institutions like this that are easy to capture, easy to define, measure, and then charge significant premium. This is what an insurance manager is interested. In. So that's what we, 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 we refer to as the missing middle. So there should be a group of people who aggregate that market and bring it to the underwriter's table. Uh, for me, that's the missing, missing link uh, in insurance terms. Over the last decade, Kenya has had significant uh, effort spent in, in, in rural Kenya in attempting to uh, design and take to market and scale um, climate insurance. Uh, could be crop and could be livestock, both. And uh, after 12 years of doing that with some, some significant experiences, a lot of potholes and difficulties, companies going to market and running away, others coming in, we have accounted for a number of challenges that were largely uh, to the detriment of scaling. Um, for example, the product design, which we talked about, products that are designed without having that customer in mind and without having the nuances of the customer in mind, that's one problem. Um, public not understanding um, uh, and not being aware of the services that the sector was making. That's another area that generally private sector does not invest too much money in. 
And the third area was lack of understanding for insurance services as a whole. That was another challenge we have seen. And of course, the, the expansive market I have talked about, the disaggregated market, the micro premiums, all that add to increasing transaction cost for, for an insurer. And that has been a significant challenge. Another significant challenge was how to take the product to the, to the customer, wherever that customer is, um, be they in Lodwa, Turkana, or, or in Mandera, or in Homer Bay. This customer needs to see the product in their face, understand the product so that they can make a purchase decision or not make. Um, that delivery channel was a significant challenge, uh, challenge that we have seen over the last decade. And so all of those are, are something that generally affect the micro market and climate risk is one of them, climate insurance. Um, in terms of bundling and its potential, um, I think um, uh, Elias was on the spot when he said um, 1 billion people in Africa, perhaps over that, a significant portion of that, perhaps 80% of that or beyond, uh, either informal or rural or pastoral or agro-pastoral, you know, all those kinds of villages and so on. So Africa is an informal market largely. Um, and uh, many of the sector farms that operate in many sectors are making profit, but also, but as they make profit, actually exhausting the market, traditional markets they're working in. Generally, there are two costs in the, in the insurance space, two costs. One, the, the risk co cost of risk, carrying the risk, the premium, the money that pays the claim, that's one cost. The other cost is the cost of acquiring that client. Those are the two main costs. Whether it is a land cruiser you drive or salary you pay to someone or sales commission or papers you print so that clients can receive uh, policy document and receipts and so on, the cost of acquiring uh, the customer is, is uh, those are the two costs. Um, from the insurance industry's point of view, generally, um, as I said earlier, um, uh, micro products including climate insurance, uh, micro in nature, the premiums are very small. Uh, for example, if I give you an example of the premium of a goat in Wajia might be 50 shillings a year. And uh, uh, if I am the insurance manager and you want me to bundle that with a service so that more of that can be bought, most likely I will look at uh, the cost of bundling. Okay, on 50 shillings, how much can I carry? Okay. So I collect 50 shillings from a goat. Can I give you um, a, a, a vaccine free for the season? Um, you know, it depends on the cost of the vaccine, of course. But generally, um, because of the micro nature, uh, insurance uh, companies see uh, bundling from that point. Uh, anytime that concept comes and it has significant point, uh, potential. We can bundle quite a lot, but it has been difficult for the insurance premium to carry other costs in micro insurance and, and climate insurance, in my experience. If you look at it from the other sectors, perhaps the lending institutions, the cooperative societies, the microfinance companies, the agro vets, uh, the, those who provide the fodder. Um, if you look at it from other service providers, uh, you might have a different view. For example, um, I could say, if you buy my fodder um, at you know, so many bells of my fodder, then I will give you a discount that, that goes into your premium. That could, be, that could be something, for example. Or you could say, for example, um, um, the purchase of, let's say, um, uh, let's say uh, the cooperative uh, society could say, um, if you save and you borrow, then, we can, we can bundle the life insurance or medical insurance or accident insurance into that borrowing, okay? So what you borrow might be 100,000. The life insurance on that might be, I don't know, um, 200 shillings. The potential for bundling is there. <clears throat> so quite a lot from my experience, we've seen that bundling works very well from the, from the other side. I think you have to look at it from the perspective of the underwriter and from the perspective of the other service sectors. Most definitely, bundling is feasible and uh, can be done. We have done that before. Um, as an industry, we have not succeeded significantly in bundling. 
um, it's the only model that can um, scale rural insurance on a large scale. Um, of course, a lot of other factors come in, consumer education, awareness, understanding of insurance service, taking the, you know, the African consumer to the level that he understands insurance as a service that is necessary. Um, I think bundling um, is a significant potential, but I want to say also it depends on the ability to digitize. If you cannot digitize, you cannot bundle. Uh, as I said earlier, one of the biggest showstoppers in insuring rural people is the transaction cost. The cost of reaching that person and actually telling that person, this product is good for you, this is what it does. That cost might mean that you, you drive, that you burn fuel, that you pay per dims, and so on. If you can do that, and in recent times we have seen digital uh, um, systems reaching communities at, at a massive scale and having the stickiness to stay with them. For example, the MPSA in Kenya is a good example. Uh, most rural people in Kenya have MPSA now, and you can't take away the phone from them. They want to stay with it. What if that were the model that will be used to bundle, to educate, to make awareness, and so on? And so aid has been working on something like that, um, uh, a system with a back end for underwriting and with front end in the last mile that uh, trains agents, captures agents, KYC's clients, collect premiums, and pays claims. So this is kind of model we have worked on. This is coming from the experience over the last uh, 12 years that we have been in this space. Next. And we have seen also that innovation like that create proximity. They solve the channel problem. They solve the rich problem, the rich problem, how to reach the client. They build trust. People trust MPS are better than uh, individuals. Uh, you can take that to the bank. If you say, I'll hold your money, they will not allow you. They, they will save in in, in, in MPS and, and, and keep that. So that, that trust is important. Training agents online, remotely, gamifying training, refreshers and so on without driving a Land Cruiser in rural areas. And therefore refreshing the channel uh, throughout the year is a major uh, possibility with digital systems. And of course, management of relationship. Thank you very much. Now I'll turn it over to the audience. Would you have any questions for our panelists? Or do you have comments, contributions? This is your time. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Anne for moderating such an informative session. I have two questions uh, for climatic insurance. So, uh, obviously for the guy in red, yes. <laughs> uh, my first question is, which countries are you majorly focusing on in terms of climatic insurance and why those countries? Is it in terms of the agricultural production or is it in terms of the climatic conditions? Because we know the Sub-Sahara is worse than Kenya. So what's your, how do you categorize which country to help or to invest in now the company? And then now uh, my second question, or do I do one at a time? No, please go ahead, just bundle the question. Okay, <laughs> my second question is, uh, what if the natural calamity that someone is insuring on uh, brought about like pests? So let's say there was drought and then locusts came and now the whole farm has been eaten out. So if no, that means you don't uh, insure against pests, what happens to the small scale farmer? And if yes, meaning you do insure against pests, what is the extent or what do you categorize as extreme enough for you guys to come in? Yeah, thank you. So the, the, the key thing is that uh, we, we, we do have uh, a number of fronts that we are looking to invest. And, and ideally, given that uh, FSD Africa is, is funded by the UK government, uh, currently we have a number of priority countries that, that, that we are dealing with um, on the first phase. And um, I, ideally, we kind of focus much of the investments in those particular countries. And, and I just mention a couple of, of those countries. We have... Uh, say Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, there's some uh, work that we are doing in Ethiopia, there's some work that is happening also in, in countries such as uh, Somalia. So ideally we have countries that we do prioritize at the first initial stage, but that does not mean that we won't be able to really invest when it comes to climate financing on other African continents 
but those are the countries that we are currently working, working with at the moment. Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of also what you've mentioned, what are we doing? Uh, we, we are coming up with a program uh, that will be looking at uh, uh, climate uh, financing, particularly uh, to bring in uh, climate-related innovations that are going to address uh, the risk that uh, climate change is causing. So you, you can always check out uh, there's a take up program that will be starting in the next uh, couple of months. And, and it will kind of uh, look at these particular innovators and, and, and farms that look into transforming uh, the climate uh, related risks uh, within the continent. And, and that will be open uh, to uh, different participants to participate in terms of really addressing uh, the issues around climate change. And ideally, I, I know there's my colleague here that deals with, uh, with the investors, so you can raise your hand uh, in the room. So if, if you want to have further discussions on the investments that we are taking, kindly see um, uh, Yego there. Uh, she, she will be able to really guide on further what we are doing. Now, on the second bit of the question, you asked the risk is on climate, but at the end of the day, pests come and do their thing. Now, insurance is quite, I would say, specific. And that's why when I was mentioning, when you look at um, what we talked about, the smallholder farmers and, and the lowest of the pyramid, that evolution of risk needs to be taken care of. And that is something, when, when you look at the conventional type of products, you cannot be compensated on a risk that was not ideally on the policy document that you signed. And, and we need now to have these discussions with the likes of Bashir, because one of the key things is that, look, we want this particular risk. If it involves and there is a particular exposure to this particular person that got this particular cover, you need to look at ways of really compensating and, and looking at you can, the way you can address the risk. But that is not something that is currently happening. So in terms of what we are ideally asking companies to do, when, when you are basically facing this type of customers, then there is need to look at the evolution of that risk and see whether they'll be, how they'll be addressed. I used to fight with Bashir when he was not, when he came, when a customer would come to me and say, tell me, like, hey, Dr. Bashir has refused to pay my claim. And I would tell him, go look and pay him even on ex gratia because he needs to understand that it was not, the rain did not, the rain did not come, or the rain came, but the pest ate everything, and he couldn't harvest anything. So ideally that comes at the point whereby he used to kind of provide what we call an ex gratia payment to the farmer just to understand. But that is something that is out of scope of our policy. So we need to kind of think about, can we cover more than really what we had specified uh, in the policy document? Thank you very much. Um, my question twofold. One is, uh, how are you working with uh, startups and maybe other organizations at the rural level to improve uh, penetration or adoption of uh, index insurance. Uh, the second one is also on um, the success stories that have been recorded. How do you make sure that um, such stories also help to improve? Do you have any programs to help improve uh, you know, awareness and adoption? Thank you. Now, um, as FSD Africa, we did initiate a program that really works into uh, moving uh, startups of innovators from an idea stage way of dealing with uh, providing resilience to market trade and investor. This particular program, we call it BIMA Lab. Ideally, is an insurance lab that accelerates these particular innovators. And uh, we've done that particular program twice in Kenya. Uh, we, we had BIMA Lab 1 and BIMA Lab 2, uh, which got us uh, 20 innovators. And so far, we've gotten uh, three innovators working with uh, different uh, companies across the continent. So there was one company that has fully signed up with Toyota uh, because they are providing telematics, uh, which basically move from an idea to a full-scale uh, innovation. There are other companies that were looking into uh, the lowest of the pyramid. So for instance, we had a company called Bismart, 
uh, that has fully now uh, gone ahead and signed up with one of the largest insurance companies in Kenya uh, to basically provide insurance to the lowest of the pyramid, basically the, the, uh, the smaller farmers and, and, and the sh small SMEs. And, and that is something that we, we, we contribute to being part of that particular program. Currently, we, we are having the same program in Ghana. Uh, in Ghana, we are calling it InnoLab, Innovation Lab, and also it's starting in Nigeria. So uh, ideally, we are working with 10 innovators in Ghana at the moment. Uh, we are currently select, going through a selection process of uh, 10 innovators in Nigeria. And again, just moving them from an idea to a point whereby they are market ready and investor ready. And what we do in this particular program, also we work along with the government because we want the government to provide with them to, the, to provide incentives that will encourage them to get into that particular line of business. We work with the regulator to ensure that they allow these particular persons to operate because uh, regulations can be quite expensive. So we are looking at ways in which they can test more of sandboxing and bootstrapping the ideas into the market. So th there are various actors that we bring in, into, into consideration. And we are planning also to move that program across the continent. So maybe uh, in June, uh, July, August there, you should be able to get something from IFSD Africa in terms of encouraging startups and working with these innovators. So Bashir, I would like you to leave us with your thoughts. Um, please keep it short. Remember how we did it in Addis. What would you want to leave the audience with with regard to microinsurance? I know you've talked about transformation, innovation, fit for purpose. Do you have additional thoughts that you want to leave us with? Yeah, that, that um, um, rural Africa offers, uh, the, you know, untapped frontier. Um, it's the space for competition for the next decade and beyond. Um, it's waiting to be tapped and to be designed and to be created. Uh, it requires bundling. Um, the communities that can bundle are there, cooperatives women groups, um, you know, agrovets, um, certain service providers, micro uh, uh, finance organizations, groups like that are capable of, uh, you know, merry-go-round groups and so on. Uh, a plethora of groups that are present in every village in Africa can be the gateway to bundling and aggregating for bundling. And so that's the line we need to go. We need to digitize and we need to make sure that transaction cost is near zero so that we are not spending money on reaching and, and awareness creation and so on. The government and the, um, uh, stakeholders needs to, need to invest in the space of awareness creation and public education. It's an area that has not been invested in um, uh, from county to national government. Uh, I think there is uh, a gap there and there is budget already there on the ground at different counties if we talk about Kenya. Extension services that and public salary are already on the ground in every village, those could be used also. Thank you. So leverage what is already existing. Yeah. Thank you. And last but not least on the airwaves, Isaac, please take it away. From where I stand, I think there's many opportunities in this space. Um, it will require a lot of concerted effort with uh, all the stakeholders. It's not one person's responsibility. There is a lot of participants in the ecosystem and uh, joint collaborations holds the key on how fast we advance this, uh, we achieve uh, the objectives on, on inclusive insurance. But where I stand from um, a reinsurer and a private sector player, I see there is a business case for advancing, um, uh, advancing uh, the whole narrative about uh, inclusive insurance and it holds the future to towards um, increasing penetration insurance penetration in the markets or in in, in africa as a whole so um, insurance companies should take advantage of it government should take government uh, advantage of it and also the the development agencies have opportunities uh, to contribute towards the betterment of humanity uh, in this case so um, I see a, a great future for this, um, for this, um, the, the whole, uh, for this topic, and I look forward to, to, uh, to for, for each, uh, for each one of us to contribute. So thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for helping us to land. 
this ship on a very optimistic note. Yes, it's possible. Yes, it can be done. The intelligence, we have it in this room and beyond. We have the money. We have the clientele. Yes, we can do it. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to thank you very much for having been with us this afternoon. And before I do so, please allow me to let our finalists please stand up for a round of recognition. So Gabriel asked the question because he is interested in taking his innovation, his idea to scale. Uh, IFC together with Sankalp and Intelecap had run an, an ag tech and inclusive insurance challenge across Africa attracted 208 innovators. We have, they have been engaging with the Sankalp team for close to a week now, and they came here to pitch to get the money. So really glad that today red represents money. <laughs> Dollars, pounds, euros, name your currency. So really happy that they will continue to benefit from the Sankalp ecosystem to, you know, to continue with the, their ideation and to continue with their business model development. So ladies and gentlemen, please allow us to recognize the finalists who are here today. All of them are winners out of 208. These are the brave ladies. One lady is missing today. These are the brave men and women in technology who want to take us to the next level in insurance or ag tech. So thank you very much, uh, innovators. I think the future is yours. Please use the time ahead for networking. Um, this is your platform. Let us see each other at the next Sankalp and enjoy the drinks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Asante.